Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Ask Mayor Miller, coming to you from the studios of WMUB. Each month, the partners of the Murphy Center for Collaborative Journalism sit down with Mayor Miller and ask your questions that you can send to mercerccj at gmail.com. Let's welcome Macon Bibb County Mayor Lester Miller. It's good to have you with us, Mr. Mayor. I know the big buzz this whole week has been the amphitheater because you had the opening concert with ZZ Top and Leonard Skinner. What can you tell us about that night? Oh, wow. I can tell you it was a very exciting night for everyone. Uh, Macon Bibb County should be extremely proud. Um, we've had six or 7,000 people there having a great time. No incidents, great parking, great food, great fellowship, and really hitting the map. I mean, we're talking about it all across the Southeast United States we're talking about the H and Health Amphitheater, and we're, we're proud of that. Now, I've heard some people say they live about three and a half miles away, and sitting on the front porch, they could hear every song, every word. So have you heard any noise complaints or anything like that? I mean, because I know y'all tested out the sound system before, and what kind of things have you done to make sure it's not bothering people? So we, we took a lot of um, effort in making sure that design uh, was compatible with neighborhoods and things around there. So. Uh, the uh, engineers, architects did their job on there. We've tested the system and, and really the, um, the decibel level that you have there for the amphitheater is no more than the traffic going by there. So you, you get kind of go to a similar, a similar uh, situation. But I think people would much rather hear a little music than hear traffic go by any day of the week. And certainly uh, I think we'll continue to address that if it creates an issue. But, you know, we have a drop dead time as far as the uh, time that music is cut off anyway uh, by, our, by our, our local ordinances. So we'll make sure that we, we're good stewards. So you did say you had a head count from that night of about 6,000 or so? Uh, we, you know, we, I think we had about 6,300, 6,500 paid. Uh, of course, we have several hundred workers there, and we have uh, the band there, uh, all, all the concessions and things like that. So it's a good crowd, and it kind of gives you a feel about what it's going to look like when we get ten or 12,000 people in there, and the parking lot looked great. And I saw that you had pictures taken with both of the bands, and everybody was holding up some sort of plaque. What, what were those plaques? I just got a commemorative record, uh, just... Um, so we can you know, remember the night. Said, you know, the opening act, who the bands were that performing and uh, when it happened and where it happened at. So it's a little memento for everyone to kind of uh, take home. We call it a gift that's changed between myself and, and, the, uh, and the, the bands, but um, you know, it's just something we can really look back later on and see what we've done. Like a little souvenir. That's right. Okay. Now your Facebook post the other night where that we had an amazing night tonight at the amphitheater. I'm so proud of the work we have put in over the last two years to make this happen. To the naysayers who have challenged us along the way, I will say, forget you. Well, I shouldn't say that. So I will say, come join the team or move the hell out of the way. We are making and we are damn proud of it. Now, I know at least one person in the comments said, you know, you can be proud without the profanity. And someone else thought that that post might have been edited, that it didn't originally say, forget you. Well, that two things. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it always said either a blank or forget, and uh, certainly uh, it initially said a blank, but I didn't want people to get the wrong idea, so I went back and typed forget. You know, it's, I'm a very passionate person. I make no bones about that. As far as the hell and the damn, I, last I checked, they're both in the Bible, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I'm not going to apologize for, for basically, uh, you know, bowing up a little bit because it's been a great event, and shortly over the last year and a half, I've taken a lot of shots. Uh, from people and naysayers that are now asking me for free tickets. So I think we've, uh, it's been a great turnaround on there. You know, I don't let Facebook comments, you know, affect my life. Although I do respond to them. I you think do respond and some people say, why does he respond? <laughs> well, I think sometimes if you acquiesce to it, then people determine that's the narrative. So if you can let them know early on that the information they're giving is not correct, you bring out the fact that most of them don't live in Macon, or they got to ax the ground with what we're doing here in, in our county, I think it it helps for, you know, promote. It also gets a lot of more people on there. If you notice that most of the comments that people make, um, now people are fighting those battles for me, so I don't have to go on there quite as much. You'll have people telling them, oh no, they had this, they had that. You should think about this and that. So they're defending Macon too, which makes me proud. And there are people on Facebook too, who say that I didn't really support this, but now that I see it, and are you hearing a lot of that? Oh, most definitely. I think we always, 
I uh, felt like if we, if we give them a good product and we build it where we need to build it at and people will come, and I think even a couple of candidates recently said, you know, I didn't really support this in the very beginning, uh, but now I do, and it's a great thing for our community, and they're kind of riding the coattails. A lot of people really didn't understand the financing. Uh, I heard one candidate, I think, locally uh, say it come out of our general fund money. It shows what kind of candidate that is, uh, talking about things they don't know about. Uh, but you really have to be educated about the process. We take a lot of steps to make sure that every single uh, new item that we do, there's a funding source for it, and that funding source doesn't involve uh, raising taxpayers' dollars. Have you done any geofencing from the other night? Do you know like how far away people came from, or is it too early? Not, not too early, because we know when they bought the tickets at, so that, that's really a uh, key to that. We've got them coming as far as Savannah, Valdosta, Jacksonville, Florida, McDonough, uh, Augusta, that's kind of the general range. Uh, people drove uh, hours. We had some people from Alabama, you know, stopped through the other day, didn't know it was the first show, and it was great for them. So. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to find that we have a lot of great acts here and people are going to travel a long ways. Uh, we estimated uh, based on the time the show ended to the time the last car got out of the parking lot, it only took about 40 minutes to get everybody out. So to get about 6,000 more you know, people out of the parking lot in 30 to 40 minutes is just incredible. And in terms of the, the people coming from the distances, how does that translate? I know Grant Blankenship wanted to know more about, um, I think you called it maybe in a conversation with him, a special sale tax fund generator. Does that mean just from people coming, or uh, that was his recollection, but uh, it may be just y'all were talking about how when people come, they spend money and there's more sales tax involved, or because it's in the EBIT, is it like a tax allocation district and revenues from that will go back into the community? Well, the EBIT has nothing to do with that, but the um, basically sales tax. We, you're talking about Sunday night uh, and at 6 or 7 o'clock in Macon Bibb County, you generally wouldn't have 7,000 people out spending their good hard-earned money uh, buying you know, stuff in our, in our community, buying gas, buying food, some staying in hotels, shopping at the mall. We had a lot of that going on the other day, uh, contributing to the economic impact. Uh, Gary Wheat and Visit Macon estimate that a sold-out show around 10,000 is going to generate $3 million in economic impact for Macon Bibb County. So that's how it converts to do that. And if you look at that, every single penny of that dollar that's part of the OLAS is going to roll the taxes back for your people in Macon. It also gives us substantial monies each year to fund things like public safety and, and uh, mental health and all those types of things that we need for a good tax base. And it prevents us from having to raise taxes on our citizens to do things that we plan on doing in the future. So that's what he was talking, I think, too, because he mentioned the OLOST, and I was trying to figure out, you know, what in that conversation, but I think you got that. Now, just was ZZ Top and Leonard Skinner a, a fan? I mean, are, are you a fan of them? Is that how they got to be the first concert? Did you kind of had a little choice about who would be the first one? I mean, sharp dressed, simple man, does that resonate with you? Or Well, I like to think so. Of course, I've, <laughs> I've been to some concerts before. They're, they're great bands. they got some local ties here, of course, to the, the Walton family. Uh, and I think that's, um, you know, it's always special for us. Quite honestly, it's just a matter of scheduling. Uh, you know, Riley Green could have been the first one if the amphitheater was delayed even further. Uh, or it could have been someone else that we perhaps were going to book a month ago, but we couldn't get them in here. So they were ne not necessarily going to be the first a show and of course we had a little a test run just with some local bands a few weeks ago it was a fairly successful smaller group uh, so it's you know it's just kind of timing and we got more action announced and uh, looking forward to a couple more coming out in the next two to three weeks and of course at another county commission candidate forum there was a little bit of talk about the Miller administration spending buying up property things like that the amphitheater was kind of lumped into that so can you um, explain your strategy when it comes to buying properties like the old Hilton Hotel and that parcel of land on Rivoli and spending the 44 million in revenue bonds on the amphitheater. What is the financial strategy behind all of that? Well, the financial strategy is to create as much economic impact in public-private partnerships without having to uh, burden the taxpayers. If you look at every project we have, e even the projects like the, um, the hotel project downtown, Spending that money on that project is going to be a drop in the bucket for what that property is going to generate. We're going to exercise site control for that project. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're using some general fund dollars for that project, but we'll turn around and reimburse ourselves back out of the splice. It's called a bond inducement, and in that we'll get that money right back, so it's going to, not going to cost our general fund any money. You look at the Pleasant Hill project that we have over there, a mere drop in the bucket, we're going to spend about a million dollars over there. We're going to create 74 new residences there, and also have a gymnasium there and a couple of uh, local entrepreneur stores there, maybe a food co-op there. That's a drop in the bucket compared to um, anything we could do with that kind of money. Uh, and we're using our blight money because we're taking that old dilapidated school down that's a blighted structure and we're going to rebuild housing there. But it's also going to help a school like L.H. Williams. L.H. Williams probably just on the amount of students that go there is one of those schools that could be considered for closure. 
this type of uh, you know proactive steps that we're taking for the housing there is going to save a school like L.H. Williams uh, in a historically black neighborhood that needs to be saved. So it's more than just about money. We're not creating any new debt. As a matter of fact, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we pay, we prepay some debt off. Uh, we inherited a lot of debt, a lot of debt, uh, millions of dollars uh, from previous administrations. And like I said, I'm not throwing any kind of dirt on them. It's just things that you have to do. Uh, so we're, we've, our bond rating has increased by two times. We expect another time. That tells you that we're making some good financial moves. And uh, like I said, every time we do a project, it always has a funding source. Just like the airport project will have a funding source that we're going to do. The Macon Mall has a funding source that we've done without taxpayer, additional taxpayer dollars. Uh, and we're going to use SPLOSH dollars because SPLOSH dollars a lot of times are paid by people that live outside our community, roughly about 68% of those people. And, of course, you've also had a lot of federal COVID relief money that has come in under your administration. So how do you plan to keep up the spending for things like the Making Violence Prevention Program going forward? Well, what we've been, what we've been doing is um, we use general fund money for that. So a lot of times the uh, people don't understand that that was not ARPA funds. The, those were funds that went into, that we have in our general fund that we gave the Community Foundation of Central Georgia to do these grants. We're going to continue to do that. We've been trying to get these companies uh, or these businesses, LLCs, these uh, nonprofits, to do uh, to be sustainable. Meaning, we're going to create them a, uh, a plan, help work with them, and collaborate with them to make sure they can sustain future funding. Uh, that means going to foundations, getting money. That means private uh, folks giving them money. Uh, it's be self-sufficient. We want to get them started and help get them some seed money, but we want them to grow. And at some point in time, they won't be getting funding from us. And that's, that's the beauty of it, get them up and running, doing a good job, and other people will step up to the plate. We're already starting to see that happen. And what kind of scrutiny are you putting on those organizations so that they can be refunded and you can make sure that the money is being as it's intended to be spent? Well, it's a very good process that they have. Community Foundation does a wonderful job of, of screening those out, but also uh, looking at those at the end of the year to make sure they kind of get their measurables there, their data is uh, being collected, uh, and they don't get refunded, uh, get additional funding if they don't meet the certain criteria. So we'll be going through another round of funding coming up. We have to designate those monies. The other thing you can use is uh, these speed zones, uh, speed zone cameras, uh, citations where people speed through the school zones, uh, endangering the lives of our kids. Uh, those people who have to pay that fine, the majority of all that money stays here in Macon Bill County has to be used for public safety. It can be used for things like um, the uh, public safety initiatives we have through our MVP program, which, by the way, just won the State Visionary Award uh, for the top uh, visionary program in, in the state of Georgia for large counties, and we're, we're proud of that. And, of course, you mentioned the school speed zone cameras. I think one thing that needs to be stressed that people don't realize is that you can be ticketed even if the lights are not flashing. I mean, the lights are flashing to show you that it's the 25 mile per hour speed limit during that time. But if you're blowing through there on 45 miles per hour or something and it's a 35 mile per hour zone, normally you can still get ticketed. It's not just when the lights are flashing, right? Well, people have to realize you can get a ticket in Macon Bibb County for exceeding the speed without a camera, without any lights going on. The, the lights are just signifying that that's a reduced speed, that you should follow the reduced speed, and you still get 10, you get, get 11 miles per hour over. You know, I, I can take and leave school zones, it's not the end all be all, we're trying to protect lives. We don't, we're not like Monroe County that has one or two school systems that can actually have a police officer stay there all day. We have about 50 or more schools in Macon Bibb County, including the private, the public, the charters, you name it, and uh, we don't have 50 extra officers, officers sitting around that can just be out there all day making sure people don't speed. So we have to use the technology, and by the way, the state of Georgia passed this law. The state of Georgia passed this law several years ago. Now, if they need to make some changes to it and they feel like that they've got to do that, then certainly we're agreeable to the changes. We're going to follow whatever law is out there, uh, and we're going to use it to make sure we protect our citizens. But I will tell you that uh, the money and the funds used for that has been 100% for public safety. These officers want raises coming up. How do you think we're going to pay for those raises? We can't keep taxing the taxpayer, right? We've got to look for creative ways like these speed zone cameras to help contribute to hiring these officers, giving them better pay. The same thing can be said for these making violence prevention programs, for these cameras that we're using all across our county, whether it's flock cameras or the Makata cameras we have downtown. Those are the type of creative things that we need to do to have better, safer environment to raise our family and our kids here in Macon, and we, we don't make any apologies about that. And of course, the Macon Bid Planning and Zoning Commission has announced that they're going to be moving April 8th through the 12th to their new facility at Macon Mall. What can you tell us about the timeline for the other county offices that will be opening up out there? Sure, we expect probably about half of them to move in April and the rest of them to be moving in June. So I expect them planning and zoning and probably business inspection and the fees will be the first couple that come out in April. 
Uh, we'll have the library fall on that as well. And then the regional commissions and, and the Mayor's Literacy Alliance are going to be probably June the 1st. Uh, they'll be, I think they'll be ready before then, but it just works better with the time. So you'll see a lot of moving parts coming up very soon. I know they're excited to get in over there. Behind that wall, when you tear the wall down, you're going to see a, a great uh, work that's been done there by ICB Construction. And uh, they just done a fabulous job of getting that thing, and they're ahead of schedule. So I, I like that part about it. And, you know, some of the officers are moving down from uh, the terminal station, and they're getting ready of those to put some other tenants there and some other activities going on there. So it's a win-win for everyone. Also on Facebook, post the concert, Gail Moulton commented that she can't wait to learn what you and your team are going to do next. So what is that? <laughs> well, we, we, we got a lot on the horizon. We're excited about uh, the, the East Bank that we were commonly referred to on the other side of the river in East Bank. We're excited about that project. We'll be selecting the master planner very soon and start that process, having some community meetings on that. Uh, we're starting to tear down the old FBO here soon, about to award a bid. Uh, in the next month of who's going to tear that down at the airport at the airport and then in may we're going to look at uh putting out an rfp there and see who can get a good construction uh manager to go out there and build that nice big guitar that everybody's looking forward to and so it's going to be a size to be a really nice restaurant for south bibb county who's been wanting that out there but it's going to be a signature piece for all our making bibb county tying into our musical history as well as uh, creating some strong economic development there at the airport find out who can make that guitar sing That's right, right. <laughs> um also, Kirk Smith wrote to us and said that he attended the GISA high school basketball tournament and was saddened to see the Coliseum in such sad shape. He said it was kind of run down and unclean. He asked if the leadership is aware of the condition and are there any plans to repair, restore, and clean what he calls a great site. Well, I think you'll be happy to know that in 2025 we have a splash coming up and one of the proposals that I'm going to make is either for a new convention center or a conference center a venue there, arena, but something that's going to upgrade that significantly. We, we've done a great job of creating tourism in Macon Bibb County. With the amphitheater now, it gives us another avenue to have sports and things. We recently invested a lot of money that we're putting together for uh, the uh, sports courts, which allow you to have more basketball, more volleyball, more cheerleading, and of course we got the baseball and softball coming down at uh, Carroll and Creighton Park. So a lot of the sports is coming on. We've gone from $3 million to $14 million in a short time. 21% up in our tourism, so we have to maintain that. We are behind the times. Our, our, some of our facilities are not in the shape they need to be. We had a recent announcement that the, uh, we're upgrading our hockey there, so that's going to be exciting. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be uh, scared to venture that maybe a new ice rink there at some point in time, or at least an additional one, uh, maybe even an outdoor one, who knows. But uh, we've been looking at some plans for that whole entire area on that side of the river as well as the other side of the river. Uh, so you're going to see some great things. The question is whether or not we can do those in the next four years or it's going to take longer. But we're going to work our hard to make sure we get it a good, successful project and start as soon as possible. I'm kind of hearing rumblings that there may be those softball tournaments you talked about coming up in the future. Anything you can tell us about what may be happening at Carolyn Creighton Park? Well, sure. We've got a tournament on March the 30th, which is this week. So we're right around the corner from our first uh, kickoff of the tournament. Probably a little smaller one than, than the other ones that we'll have, but uh, maybe not. 30, 40 teams, perhaps. Uh, we've got some uh, set up for the next several weeks. I think there's about 14 set up between now and uh, August. Uh, some of these will have several hundred teams in there, so we're excited about that, both baseball, softball, and adult and youth. So uh, getting those parts back to full use is, is great, and it's going to happen at the same time that making bacon uh, will happen. So there'll be a lot of activity down at Carolyn Creighton Park, and uh, we're excited about the gateway to Carolyn Creighton Park. We recently purchased a property there, too. Uh, one for a very good price from Norfolk Southern and the other one right there on the corner that we've cleared out for parking and other things. So it's going to provide a great gateway into the park. And we're going to finally get those roads fixed leading into the park that has all the bumps and the water. We finally figured out uh, the problems there. Now we just got to navigate how do we get that fixed. So underneath the train trestle there on Walnut Street, is that where you're talking? Yes. Because that, that was one of my questions because it really is in such disrepair. And I was un always under the impression that that was tied into Norfolk Southern because the trestle is theirs. So it, 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 do they control the road underneath as well? or It's, it's kind of a complicated issue, but but bottom line is, is if we've done some testing underneath there and you got you got, uh, of course, ditches and tunnels and things that run underground there. You've got a stream. You've got the Old Muggy River there. All that stuff comes through there, and it creates, uh, you know, it's going to flow in the direction that water goes to. And uh, you, you attract way more water, water there that you can pump out, so it kind of spreads out. And you can't pave a road in that kind of situation without stopping that problem because what happens is you get those rumbles just like you did. That's been tried before. So you really got to get to the root of the problem, which we're going to do. Uh, our plan is to do some things uh, on the properties that we bought there underneath that can attract a lot of that water uh, and, and naturally go to another place toward the river. It kind of diverts it off the road. It saves that road. And we're going to clean up the, the streetscape. I've got some, um, 
looking at, with some engineers right now to design the streetscape on the side, maybe put a fence underneath that bridge to prevent people from camping out there and, and having grills and unsafe things there, and just making it more friendly coming into the park. Now, I know um, closing weekend of Cherry Blossom, we had some rain, you know, and as I was going into the park, I noticed that the MWA trucks were trying to pump up some water that was on Smoky Glover Drive and on into the park. And then I saw public works trucks, you know, dumping dirt in there and stuff. Is that part of that drainage as well in the kind of the lawn part of the park? Because I know that the county has done a lot of work fixing the drainage issues out on the softball fields right. as part of those projects. So. Well, it's part of the same thing. But like I said, you're next to the Old Muggy River. Uh, mm -hmm. Water's going to go where it goes and uh, it don't run uphill. <laughs> so it's gonna go where it's gonna go, and we put in larger pipes in there, fix some that will collapse uh, last year to help it out. But when you get a real good rain down there, you're gonna have those issues. So Macon Water Authority's done an excellent job, as, as well as our people, of getting those things drained and sand as much as we can for an event that happens like Cherry Blossom. But we're looking for long-term solutions. Uh, it's gonna require some significant money, and, it, and it's been kicked down the curve. A uh, can's been kicked down the road for too long now. We got to really bite the bullet, look at some splash dollars too for infrastructure in there to make sure that problem is taken care of once and for all. And also you mentioned the properties that the county bought on Walnut Street, the old batting cage, and then property from Norfolk Southern. And Grant Blankenship wants to know what happened when you cleaned out the brush there where there were kind of urban encampments there. What happened to those people? Well, we, uh, we spent about a week going over there and talking to speaking with each one of those folks, making sure they uh, had the resources they need, let them know the services they can get to provide to them. It started out as a very large uh, group of people. Uh, the day of, there was nobody left there, maybe one or two people. Uh, we always store their stuff. Uh, if they have some stuff there they can't do there, pack it up for them. Uh, but we give them plenty of time. We have our, our resource officers going over there. Part of our homeless coalition goes over there. And really, it's really a great initiative that goes out there months in advance when we look at these types of things and uh, so I think everyone was very well taken care of there we didn't have any issues that I'm aware of uh, but things like that happen from time to time and will continue to happen but we're always going to do outreach first. And the proximity to daybreak you would imagine that the people who were in those encampments were connected already to the services there so everybody's been taken care of as far as what you know. Um, Caleb Slinkard of the Georgia Trust for Local News wants to know more about the new ATVs that were unveiled during the Cherry Blossom Festival and how they're coming to play in downtown policing. Okay. Well, as you recall, several months back we had uh, the downtown businesses, and, and, and rightly so, had some issues with crime, and they wanted it addressed. And one of the things they talked about, more importantly, was having um, more of a police presence, or at least a, a presence there with, with public safety, uh, some alleyways that were having some issues. We've had a lot of complaints with Carolyn Creighton Park, with people being back there, uh, doing some vandalism, blocking the entrances to the Amazon Park, I mean the river, river trail. Uh, so one of the best ways you can do that, we believe, is with ATVs. It's worked in other parts of our, our of the country that have been very successful. They're good for crowd control. We were having problems, if you recall, for thousands of people being out on MLK and Cherry and, and really police officers were just camping out in a corner, you know, somewhere and not the best visibility. Uh, you're going to have to walk two officers at a time around areas through alleys and uh, deal with issues. So more visibility means these ATVs that can ride on the road. Uh, they will be tagged and they have lights. Uh, and you can have people operating those as well. Uh, very good visibility um, and not a lot of cost. And these ones downtown were purchased with uh, dollars that we received from the Peyton Anderson Foundation specifically for this purpose and that purpose only. And it, it also included some money to pay for officers that were riding on those, whether they're code enforcement officers or others. You can get down the alley pretty good on those. But more importantly, if you try to walk around the block, how many times are you going to walk around in a, in a shift? If you try to ride around on one of those things, how many times? You're going to be more efficient, more exposure, and people will always see them. So it's going to provide a, a safer atmosphere. Anytime you have police presence, it's going to discourage and deter uh, people from committing crimes. But if something were to happen there and they need assistance, then of course we've got somebody ready, willing, and able there. And they can also call the police. If it's not a deputy, say it's a code enforcement, uh, they can get on the radio and call a deputy and let them know that this is really something serious you need to get here as opposed to uh, someone just heckling someone or, or panhandling. So it, it allows us to save resources. It should provide for better response times for the sheriff's deputies. And Grant Blankenship said a lot of those officers and code enforcement are state certified to carry weapons and have arrest powers. So do you see them becoming more of like a municipal police force since, you know, if you mentioned before that the sheriff is a constitutional officer and unlike prior administrations before consolidation that had a municipal police department that served under the mayor, um, is that a way for you to have sort of a police force? I don't know if it's, a, it could be a first step in one if we ever had to have one, but more importantly is 
we're trying to relieve the sheriff of some duties that perhaps someone else can do uh, because they do have challenges sometimes hiring uh, deputies all over the place. So if we can have a code enforcement officer going in and checking all the cameras at these bars, and that's, that's less sheriff deputies that have to do that. And it pulls away from them being able to do better response times. If we can have a code enforcer riding through the alleys and seeing the fact that people are illegally dumping or perhaps people are blocking the entrance and exits there where ambulance couldn't get through there if they needed to be because they've got a car there, then they can have those cars towed. Or if they have an aggressive panhandler that has a warrant on them, they're able to actually take that person into custody, book that person if they needed to be, or if they see something that happens on their watch. So this frees up deputy time, which is very valuable when you have a shortage, and allows our deputies to have a better response time once the whole program is installed. So I, I do think, and it's easier to get, right? It's easier to get someone, uh, code enforcement, even though they're sworn in on the sheriff, and most of these guys, men and women, used to be in the, a deputy somewhere, or in the military, or a ranger. So they got the experience there. Uh, so where we can't get them in the sheriff's department, we can get them there. It's still a win-win for making. It really should be counted as a number for deputies in the office and you wouldn't be considered so short, but it's gonna free up response times. How is the blight initiative going more than three years in? One of the commission candidates the other night at the forum was talking about how you know she wished that people could take a pause and look more at these historic homes and see if there's any value in restoring them. So do you think that the blight program will continue to gain steam and do you think code enforcement will ever get caught up on all the demolitions that need to occur? Well, I'll start from the last question first. And yeah, they're definitely going to get caught up, but we're starting to see a little bit slow in that now. We're, we're approaching 700 houses. What I'll tell anyone who, who thinks that we're just tearing down houses that can be lived in is that's simply not the case. The houses that we're tearing down are blighted houses. They've got gang of drug prostitution use. They've got an open exposed roof from a fire. Uh, they've got vandalism happening there. Uh, they're overgrown. They're causing a health and safety issue to their neighbors there. They've got uh, lead paint. They've got asbestos. These are houses that neighbors in the community that live in those communities have complained about for years and years and years. And we're taking initiative to get those things out. And we look to go back and infill with new homes in those locations. And our second process there is to making sure that we infill these with nice, good, affordable homes for those folks that live in the neighborhoods, which they ask for and they need. We're not pausing anything, I can assure you that. When they keep going into all blighted houses are taken care of, the ones that can be saved, we have other tools in our tool belt to take care of those houses that can be saved. And we're not tearing down historical property. Just because a house is old doesn't make it historical. There's no significance to some of these houses there. They're just completely burned out. The owner has got the money from the insurance company and they've left our community with a, with a baggage there. So we're gonna keep taking that. We're gonna be very aggressive in doing that. What I will say, these code enforcement officers are doing a great job of preventing blight before it happens. By going out there and making sure that people are up to code and doing what they need to do so the house doesn't come blighted down the road. So we're actually preventing blight before it happened by being proactive rather than reactive. And that's what we're gonna do with a lot of their time once we're caught up on the demolitions. But we're approaching, we're, I think we're at 680 today, uh, probably 700 in the next, by the next month or two. So uh, we're about to hit a great plateau for Macon Bibb County. We mentioned a little bit about SPLOST coming up and the collections from the 2018 SPLOST are running ahead of schedule and could even be satisfied you know, sometime early next year. So um, there's even talk of maybe a referendum in the spring for continuing that SPLOST because there's kind of an issue if you're going to have another SPLOST, like if it expires and people have to stop collecting that extra penny and redo their registers and redo everything and then a few months later have an election. So what kind of major issues are you considering for the 2025 SPLOST proposal? Well, first of all, we, we are very well aware, well aware that the um, SPLOST are ahead of collections. What started out as a 10-year plan turned into about a six and seven. That's a testament to what Macon Bibb County is doing because we're ahead of collections means people are coming here and spending money on their sales tax, just like we thought they would. A lot of that's doing with tourism, like we mentioned. We expect probably by July or August next year. That's why we'll have a referendum in a, um, March, April next year. We'll have a referendum uh, that the people can choose whether or not to renew the spots. It's not an additional penny. It's the same penny just being renewed. We've been talking about, you know, I, if I had to give you just something that's dear, near and dear to people's hearts is roads, you're going to see the largest, most single largest investment in roads in this next plot that we've ever seen. Uh, you can think about, we've been increased it fivefold in the last couple of years, getting roads paved and potholes repaired. You're never going to play catch up there. Even though we've done five times what they've done in the past as far as our funds are concerned, you're going to see 25 times that with this splash dollars. 
And you can take that to the bank because we're going to focus on roads. We're going to pave all of Macon Bibb County. We're going to fix the potholes where they should be fixed. That means paving the road. And we're not going to leave any stone unturned, any hole unfilled. And we're going to do that because people, I think, are willing to bet on themselves once again and make sure that we put that penny to good use. We're also looking at new things like acquiring a site for a potential new detention facility or new jail. Uh, that's going to have to happen. We're looking for some economic development that's going to have to happen. We're going to continue to focus on public safety, which we're going to do, and some recreation needs that we have. But we're going to be smart with our money. We're going to do it in such a way it's going to create economic impact for everybody. It's going to help take care of the issues that we face in our community. But I'd be willing to say we're going to pay off debt uh, that should have been paid off a long time ago. We're going to pay up paved roads all over Macon Bibb County. And uh, we're going to have some new facilities, perhaps at the uh, Centerplex Coliseum, that's going to bring, create more economic development to help lower our taxes. We're going to continue to support public safety. Uh, and we're going to take care of the, the needs that we have right now with our fire departments and our police and all those nice things that we always do. But we're going to do this in a smart way. Uh, the citizens are going to make that decision and they can decide whether they want to do it or not. But a lot of these projects take more than just SPLICE funding. It's going to take things like grants we got, infrastructure that we're requesting from the state um, and from, from the federal government. And it's going to take some creative things like bids and tads and things like that that we need to use every, uh, every per personal tool and tool belt that we have to make this thing work other than just splash dollars. BID is Business Improvement <laughs> District and TAD is Tax Allocation District where all the tax dollars go back into that one community. That's correct. And the Business Improvement District, um, property owners pay more in taxes that is put right into that community as well. Just because no, not everybody understands <laughs> the, the, the little um, uh, abbreviations that, that we know. Um, talking about roads a little bit, we've heard a little bit about GDOT plans for pedestrian improvements over on Gray Highway. Understand Bass Road widening is still kind of years off and that Forest Hill, um, not really sure what's going to be happening as far as the state is concerned on Forest Hill. I know there's been some repaving around the bend there by the apartments, right. you know, past Wimbish. So what, what do you think on those horizons we can expect, like Forest Hill and Bass Road? Well, I think Bass Road is ahead of schedule. Uh, we are already taking care of doing some right-of-ways, improvements out there. Uh, this is just, it's not that we don't want to do it. We would start tomorrow, but there's things that have to be done ahead of time, and a lot of that is controlled by the state and federal government. So when you have their funds let, they know they're not going to have this money until this year. So we do all of our work. We, we've expedited as much as possible. We're going to start doing that. The, the initial plan is going to be from uh, right there at Providence where the turning point is on the other side of the interstate all the way through Riverside Drive with that little small turnaround that has to be, you have to have better out there. Uh, you know, crossing over to where A School and, and other developments are coming there past Bass Pro Shop. Um, it's, it's going to be some growing pains. We all know that. But it's way ahead of schedule in my opinion as far as uh, how fast we could get there. I've let the uh, commissioner himself know. I've met with GDOT many times myself. I've talked to the governor about it. I said, uh, we have a lot going on in that area. We need, if we can let that sooner, we'll come up with our, our part of the dollars. Uh, so it's not money. It's mm -hmm. just uh, their time and their processes that we have to navigate. And then, you know, obtaining some right-of-ways there. Uh, we've also got, you know, some, some, um, some creeks and streams over there, and you have to deal with EBA and, and on those types of things. So it's not just as simple as let's just widen it up today and it's just the money. It is a very expensive project. We could not do it without the help of the federal government uh, and, and, the, and the proceeds we got there. You're, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. And going from Riverside Drive to Providence Boulevard, but then what happens at Providence goes back to two lanes? Is there any plans to further expand Bass going Forward? I wouldn't think um, I, I wouldn't think so. What they're telling me there, they're going to do some bridge work there. Of course, there's a new bridge that's coming right there, and then there's going to be some delays on that. Uh, there's a lot of property going up and down that road, and it would be incredibly expensive to try to buy all the right of way. Like if you're trying to go all the way to Zebulon Road, but I suspect once they alleviate this first problem, they'll, they'll decide what to do with that. But you probably are some years off on that. But right now, the most immediate need seems to be between Providence all the way to Riverside over there, where the new mall, you know, new new mall is. So I think that's uh, probably the most 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 urgent. We're going to continue to look at Forest Hill Road. You know, that's been on again, off again, but with the new you know emergence of the mall, that may be back on again. Uh, we set aside some funds for that. Uh, we have done some paving over there to alleviate some of the issues right now. But originally, that road's going to be straightened out, so that's a lot bigger project than just paving some roads. But if it ever gets dropped and they don't do it, we'll pave the whole road, uh, just like we're going to do with this other money. And talking about you know the SPLOS wish list too as well. Do you plan forums around the community with the commissioners in terms of you know what may be in the public's interest to 
put on that list? Or? Well, we always do that. And I think uh, one thing we're elected democracies, so that means the people that get elected are supposed to be advocating for the people who elected them there. We wanted to make sure that we go through this election cycle. You know, we, we have all, theoretically, all nine positions and, and the mayor are up for re-election. So uh, May 21st or shortly thereafter, if there's runoffs, uh, folks that are elected and re-elected and folks that are, that are coming on starting January next year, we'll have conversations with them. We'll have planning sessions with them as well uh, to go ahead and bring people into the fold and make sure that we have a good plan going in. So come probably November, December, we'll have the projects complete. Uh, we won't have as many specific projects. I wouldn't anticipate that you used to have in the past uh, because it ties your hands too much. It makes you build things you don't need when times changes. There'll be general buckets uh, like infrastructure and recreation, public safety, um, economic development, all those types of things, buckets that you'll have so you can be flexible because what, what may be good for, for Megan Bibb County while Lester Miller's here right now for four years, in six years may be something different. We may go through another pandemic. We may have other needs. Public safety may be completely under control, and we don't need as many of this, that, and the other. So you never know what the needs are. You never know what the cost and interest rates and the inflation is. So you have to be a little bit flexible there and not be so rigid in those things. So I think we look forward to a more relaxed uh, area there, but we're certainly going to get uh, input from the community. And I know a while back you took the county commission out on a field trip to Tobisofki in the duck ponds there. Any thoughts about something special for the Splost on that side of Tobisofki that's kind of like an untapped gem? I don't know about any Splost, but I think you'll see some um, some private, private, private investment, investment there. I think you see some private investment uh, out there, and I think you'll see a lot. You're going to see a lot of good, good, great changes. Uh, Commissioner uh, Wilder's been advocating this for a while, and finally we're, we're getting the, to the point where we're taking care of the dam over there as much as possible. There'll be some money there for, for, for the dam, of course, to put that to bed once and for all. There's gonna be some development inside the, uh, the property there, some more entertainment activities there inside the Tobisofki, uh, some new facilities I expect, and some better use of some properties on the outskirts there that's not getting used. That's gonna really help the people that live on the lake as well, but also create some more uh, recreational activities for people uh, and benefits for people that live around the area. So. We're excited about that. That's a process, as you may know, and it, it requires uh, making sure we have spots in place, and make sure we have a private investor that can meet the criteria that's needed in this economic development, you know, economic um, atmosphere that we have. And what is going on with the East Bank project um, and the Okmogi Monument? Any any word on that? Uh, we're we're being silent right now on purpose about the national park. We we're very excited, but we're going to be silent and uh, hopefully. Uh, votes start taking place fairly soon. Um, the uh, master planner is being selected uh, as we speak and we'll be working out some contracts with, with the folks that's going to be doing the master plan. That's incredibly encouraging. Uh, I mentioned before you're talking about six to 12 months we've seen real results there, but you're going to start seeing some great plans for restaurants and, and uh, housing and retail and, and um, entertainment on that side of the river very soon. We're excited about that and like I said, because it is in a tax allocation district, the TAD, all the money for that development, which is probably $350, $400 million, not paid by Macon Bibb County. So these folks who, who think that that's got something to do with us as far as that, we acquired the site. That was our job to acquire the site. Now we can control the site. And now we can do land lease with these folks, which means they pay us a, a yearly fee, and they can build onto the property. All that value, the upward uh, development of that property, all the taxable value, then has to be used in that tax allocation district in East Macon. That's how you get the news restaurants. That's how you, you prevent the closings over there from happening. That's how you get roads fixed. That's how you get blight removed. That's how you get new housing over there. It will happen. It takes a project like this and like the Centerplex and even the old health department property. All three of those properties are going to have to be engaged to ignite uh, and kick off the, the revitalization of East Macon uh, in a positive way. And it's, it's something that's going to happen, but if you don't plan for it, it's never going to happen. And that's what we're doing is planning for it right now. I know one of the candidates mentioned that the kids over around Fort Hill really would like to have a swimming pool <laughs> over there. So maybe those things are possible. One other question too about Tobisofki I meant to ask you, what is going on with the water park? Uh, really nothing. I mean, they, they moved some of the properties over there. That's part of the natural, you know, the project that we talk about, there's going to be something bigger and better out there. Uh, something people can enjoy, something's needed uh, on that side of town and something's going to be a uh, great benefit to the people at the lake, uh, but it's in the early stages on there. We still have some uh, details to work out uh, on that. But, but the uh, existing park is no, I mean, not still, open now, right? Not, I it's mean, not it's open. Uh, we, we, we ended the relationship that we have with, with the people that were there before in, in a good way. Uh, we salvaged what we could over there. It hasn't cost the taxpayers any dollars, uh, but what will replace that is going to be something uh, short of a miracle for that area. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for sitting well, down with us. Remember, this is your program, too. So each month we are sitting down with Macon Bibb County Mayor Lester Miller. So send your questions, your comments, and your concerns to mercerccj at gmail.com, and we'll get you some answers next month. Thanks for joining us.